are very pleased to introduce our next presenter, Destiny Rodriguez, presenting Sex Work in the 21st Century, Misconceptions, Stigma, and Capitalism. Take it away, Destiny. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Destiny. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And today I will be talking about sex work. Okay. Our first question is, what is sex work? You might be asking yourself that question. Sex work is receiving money or goods in exchange for consensual services or erotic performances. But who is considered a sex worker? The word prostitute is an outdated word since the 1970s. Using the word prostitute has connotations of criminality and immorality. Many people who sell sexual services prefer the term sex worker and find the word prostitute demeaning and stigmatizing, which contributes to their exclusion from health, legal, and social services. Although sex worker is used as a synonym for prostitute, sex worker can refer to individuals who do not directly engage in sexual activities, such as pole dancers, sex toy testers, and strip club managers. There is no singular sex industry because sex workers range from dominatrix work, to street walking, to cam girls, to burlesque, and everything in between. Is sex work harmful? The fact that sex work is work does not mean that it is good work or empowering work or harmless work. However, sex work is not inherently harmful, but criminalization and stigma do make sex work circumstantially harmful. A question I often hear people ask is, how would you feel if your daughter or loved one was a sex worker? But that's completely the wrong question. Imagine she is and ask yourself, how safe is she at work right now? And why isn't she safer? The horror stigma Sexual services sell sexual in services in order to earn a livelihood. The vast majority of sex workers choose to do sex work because it is the best option they have. Many sex workers struggle with poverty and destitution and have few other options for work. Others find that sex work offers better pay and more flexible hour and the working conditions are way better. When you are visible to the public as a sex worker, the horse stigma leads to a very dangerous life. Their access to comprehensive health care is limited, either by biases from the doctors themselves or the fear sex workers have for outing themselves by asking frequent sexual health checks. Not only health care, but treatment from the police, their words or credibility is questioned, which leads to crimes just being unreported or unjustly blamed on them. Police will also blackmail sex workers into providing services for their silence, which they don't always hold up their end of the bargain, so you can still end up in prison even though he bribed you that you wouldn't. Slut shaming. Even civilian, which is a word for non-sex workers, women are ashamed of having and expressing their sexuality, although men are praised for expressing theirs. How do we feel about the terminology man whore? Is this a positive or a negative term? Outing yourself as a sex worker has long 
long-term consequences. So not only are you shaming, might be getting shamed from your peers, from your loved ones, but it's also making a very unsafe environment for you. The primary focus of my presentation is to make clear anyone committed working towards justice and freedom should be supporting sex workers' rights. Sex workers are humans who deserve e equal human rights. Sex workers often face adversity in feminist spaces because of what prostitution symbolizes. These spaces are ignoring what the criminalization of prostitution does to people who sell sexual services. For far too long, it's been socially acceptable to ostracize, ignore, and silence feminist sex workers. Society believes sex workers make a living objectifying themselves, and many blame them for society's over-sexualization of women. When feminists discuss sex work, they are often labeling sex workers' experiences as empowering or exploitive but discussion should be made under the conceptual framework that sex work is service work. So how does feminism and sex work go together? Feminist discussion currently revolves around whether sex work can be feminist. The debate is usually analyzed through the oppression exploitation and violence experienced towards women in sex work. However, a better discussion would be, how does the industry affect feminist sex workers individually? It is important to remember, just like an employee in any other industry, sex workers should be expected to defend, shouldn't be expected to defend the existence of sex work in order to deserve equal workers' rights. Society demonizes the relationship between the worker and the customer, believing the customer has absolute control. This is a big contributing factor to why we imagine the sex worker as a victim. But we wouldn't need to if we understood the contract between customer and sex worker. Consent, especially in sex work, is constructed with many factors. which include setting, time, emotional state, trust, value, and desire. So even though money is a necessity, pleasure isn't, and the absence of pleasure isn't a withdrawal of consent. Some feminists seek to condemn prostitution and see sex workers as victims, which is why most sex workers don't identify themselves as feminists. But sex workers have been part of the feminist movement before the 1970s. Sex workers should not be hidden in these feminist spaces. Secrecy re reinforces stigma, shame, and can compromise sex workers' ability to control their own labor. Feminists have been deconstructing, challenging, and forced to create hybrid identities because the way our capitalistic patriarchal society erases these identities. This is evident by how much of women's lives are based on the du duality of good girl versus bad girl, lesbian versus hetero, virgin versus whore, etc. Solidarity is crucial in a future where all feminist champion sex workers demands to be safe, paid, and heard. A united front ensures everyone's fair share of resources and allows survivors to access healthcare and justice. Sex work is service work because laborers are performing sexual and non-sexual tasks for the sake of another. There must be room for the sex worker to identify publicly and collectively what their wants and needs are. As with any other chosen career path, being told the only resolution to their problems is to exit the industry is not a good solution and is not sustainable. 
So is sex work empowering or degrading? It's actually neither. Not everyone likes their job. Not everyone hates their job. Other people may not like your job, but that doesn't take away from the legitimacy of your work. Working safely on your terms is the point. Viewing sex work as empowering invalidates sex work as work. Some myths and misconceptions about sex work are that prostitution is degrading and shouldn't even be classified as work. Women's work is often devalued though. It is in a capitalistic society run by patriarchy, women's work has no economical value and is expected to be given for free, especially with work like domestic work or for example, your teachers who stay after work late, women professors are more likely to hold office hours and keep their office hours. Two, sex workers are fighting for the right of men to buy sex, which is completely wrong. <laughs> Recognizing sex work as sex work, as service work, is not fighting for the right for men to buy sex. The buyer's perspective has no relevance to the issue. Sex workers are fighting for human rights. Three, the Nordic model, which criminalizes clients, is feminist. The Nordic model from Sweden only protects the buyer. Nordic model decriminalizes all those who are prostituted, provides support services to help them exit, and makes buying people for sex a criminal offense in order to reduce the demand that drives sex trafficking. But violence and unjust arrests towards sex workers have not decreased. Four, sex workers are uneducated, drug addicted, street walkers. There is no cookie cutter of what a sex worker looks like. Some sex workers are novelists, academics, and creatives, and you would never know. Five, the police keep sex workers safe. In the US, sex workers report sexual harassment, verbal abuse, and rape when being arrested by the police. These arrests are also deeply racist, which 85% of those arrests are Black or Latina. So why do people support the prohibition of sex work? They believe it's forced, that it's human trafficking, that it creates social inequality, and it questions their feminist values. But it's important to remember that sex work is often a survival strategy for all types of minority groups, poor, homeless, immigrants, and just completely lacking choices. And because of that, they are even heavily more profiled. It's also important to remember that sex work and human trafficking are very different entities. Legislation is specifically needed to those issues versus trying to demonize an entire industry. The real answer is to give workers more legal protection so that they don't fear reporting without fear of arrest. Not all migrant workers are forced. There is an economic need. There may be fear or abuse from these smugglers, but the same thing can be said about the agricultural or domestic work industry. While buyers are mostly men with money and most sellers are women without, when sex work is recognized as work, the discussion of workers' rights is easier to have.
solidarity amongst feminists, both non-sex workers and sex workers, will help create new legislation and change the stigma around sex work. So I wanna to touch more on what is the difference between human trafficking and sex work. Human trafficking is an egregious human rights violation involving the threat or use of force abduction, deception, or other forms of coercion for the purpose of exploitation. This may include forced labor, sexual exploitation, slavery, and more. On the other hand, sex work is a consensual, consensual transaction between adults, where the act of selling or buying sexual services is not a violation of human rights. Confusing trafficking with sex work can be harmful and counterproductive. There are four different types of legal approaches currently. The first is legalization, which legalizes and regulates. This isn't good for human rights. It is expensive and difficult to comply. Backdoor criminalization ends up happening where marginalized groups often jump through more hoops to get a proper venue or license or financial resources. The second is partial criminalization. Brothel keeping or soliciting is not allowed. And brothel keeping is considered two or more sex workers in the same household, which means working behind a closed door and alone. Since brothel keeping uh, is dangerous in that aspect. It leaves sex workers vulnerable to violence, Vul uh, and vulnerable working together because Johns can use the law to threaten or act against the sex worker. The criminalization of street walking creates dangerous situations because they are forced to work alone and in isolated areas to avoid detection. So even if a sex worker was trying to be safe and have a partner, they could end up getting in trouble and in an unsafe situation because somebody knows the law and knows that now they can't kick me out of their house because they are considered a brothel. There is full criminalization, which is what we have here in the US, uh, except for in Nevada and which criminalizes the seller, buyer, and third parties, believing the fear of arrest will deter people from selling sex. Choosing between work or not eating, and you'll end up breaking the law. So it has not stopped people from selling sex. We know prostitution as the oldest profession it has not gone away with uh, full criminalization and it's not the right way to go about it. Fourth, we have the Swedish and Nordic model, which I talked a little bit about before, which criminalizes the buyers. But this hasn't changed the number of people who solicit sex. Now finding clients is harder and forced to find a manager or a pimp Screening clients becomes harder because Johns are scared of the legal consequences. So when you are screening a client, you have to decide whether he is a dangerous John or is he just being really nervous and it could lead to some unsafe predicaments. What do sex workers want? Sex workers want decriminalization. Decriminalization means removal of criminal and administrative penalties that apply specifically to sex work, creating an enabling environment for sex workers' health and safety. For decriminalization to be meaningful, it must be accompanied by a recognition of sex work as work, 
allowing sex work to be governed by labor law and protections similar to other jobs. While decriminalization does not resolve all challenges that sex workers face, it is a necessary condition to realize sex workers' human rights. Workers are allowed to work collectively. Bosses are held accountable. They are allowed to refuse clients for any reason and workers' rights are protected. In New Zealand, under Prostitution Reform Act of 2003, 96% of streetwalkers feel the law protects their rights. They are the only place to have decriminalized sex work. There has not been a spike in the amount of people doing sex work or buying. It's important to know that these regulations were made in collaboration with sex workers. I have a short video of sex work is work. have simplistic and sort of stereotypical ideas about what sex work is and who sex workers are. We hope that people come into this space and kind of challenge their ideas and leave with a more complicated view of sex workers, sex work, uh, and what sex workers uh, demand. Criminalization, generally speaking, uh, what we see is that it tends to uh, push sex work underground. What happens when sex work is underground is that there are no standards at all. You can't really hold uh, you know, your employer accountable for an unsafe workplace. And in fact, a lot of sex workers like, won't re even report kind of more abusive things uh, to the police uh, because they run the risk of being persecuted themselves. The tagline for this, this pop-up is sex work is work. We believe that by bringing uh, workplace health and safety standards, by bringing the labor law into the sex industry, bringing it to sex work, that is how we actually increase the power of workers, increase autonomy. I hope everyone loves my art and makes them laugh and makes them think. As a comedian, I really try to bring levity to the work that we do. People see my presence as an opportunity to shame me, to degrade me, to talk about me. What I really want to do is celebrate the people who do this work and let us have a laugh because, you know, celebration is an act of resistance. My name is Empress Wu. I'm an organizer with Red Canary Song, which, um, I think congregated in 2017 around the death of a migrant massage parlor laborer whose name was Yang Song. Her story highlights the intersection of so many different populations and identities, specifically that of a person of color um, doing sex work in New York, that of a person who is a migrant laborer doing sex work in New York, um, that of a person who doesn't have citizenship doing labor in New York, um, that of a person who doesn't speak like the language very well. In places like the United States, uh, where there's kind of a conflation of economic marginalization uh, and uh, racial injustices uh, and also gender injustices. Like we see that the most marginalized tend to be uh, women of color, in particular black women, uh, trans women also very marginalized in sex work.
when we talk about sex worker policy or any policy for that matter, um, it can often become really abstract. It can become about data sets. It can become uh, about you know this public discourse that's happening. This pulls us away from that, right? And it moves us closer to actually taking a look and a beautiful one at that, uh, at the people who would be directly impacted by the policy change. I'm Midori, and this is my piece, Invocation. In Japan, there are many rituals where tools of the trade, when they're broken, they are retired, like a broken sewing needle or broken hair combs that indicate the objects that served in the various labor. I put out a call to the public for current and former queer sex workers to memorialize and donate that object. You know, we all have that thing that we hold on to. It feels disrespectful to throw it away, but you also need to let it go. So I am receiving these objects and giving it new life as a collective memory. These are each objects that hold stories that we may never know, tales of labor, of craft, of life, of being in entertainment. I use hemp rope. This is also not only used in bondage, but it is more specifically used as the lines for curtains in theater. In Broadway, all those stage curtains, it's pulled up by hemp. You are welcome to enter into here. It is best experienced from within these objects. There is a transparency but there is also the division between the public and the private. This red umbrella uh, was first used by sex workers since 2001. The red symbolizes beauty and uh, the umbrella symbolizes strength. This is a, a global symbol of sex worker organizers and sex worker rights across the globe. You probably know a sex worker. Just have a consideration for the world we live in that is really phobic and doesn't make it safe for people to be out. This is a poem about me and you, and you especially who I have not yet met. The sisterhood behind closed doors, beneath mood lighting, how your work is miscalculated, the quiet eruption of underground volcanoes, the way we were never meant to be seen. Okay, great. So actually, as of June 10, 2019, New York has proposed the New York State Senate bill to start decriminalizing sex work. And this bill has been worked on collectively with sex workers and with their wants and needs. The bill was supported by groups like uh, Make the Road New York, New York City Anti-Violence Project, Sex Workers Project, Vocal New York, and Womankind. Pornography is a $10 billion industry, but the profits aren't trickling down in the hands of women. A monopoly was happening by the men who run the porn industry. Although pornography is a tool of men seen through the male gaze, and the internet is a tool created by men, in the hands of women, these tools can be used to earn financial freedom. This is evident in the fact that the cyber porn industry has grown to a $1 billion industry. But there have been some bumps in the road, like FOSTA-SESTA, which is the Fighting, Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act slash Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act. Cyber porn has been under direct attack since FOSTA-SESTA has been signed into law. Craigslist, Backpage, and more sites were forced to close their site altogether or parts of it. When you push out sex workers from the safety of their homes to the streets, it leads to a very dangerous situation. Some facts about FOSTA SESTA. President Trump actually signed the SESTA into in April 2018, 
which expanded on existing federal criminal law to target online platforms where users discuss sex work and related topics. Now platform owners can be prosecuted under this expanded law, even in cases where they didn't know people were using these platforms to engage in sex work. And even in situations where there is no indication of coerced sex trafficking of adults or minors. An online platform can be prosecuted under federal and state law or held civilly liable for hosting content created before FOSTA even passed. The crushing criminal and civil liability created by the law has incentivized platforms to over censor their users. And this creates a bias in the community, which, for example, a plus sized model who has a little more skin in the same bikini that a skinny model would be wearing would be flagged way before her pictures. When platforms err on the side of censorship, it marginalizes voices that are hit the hardest. In the immediate aftermath of FOSTA's passage and implementation, there has been a sharp rise in sex and trafficking crimes. These laws are always changing retroactively, so it's hard for these sites to keep up with what they should be allowing and how they should censor in all case by case. What does the 21st century woman want? She wants a respectable salary, control of her work environment, personal security, and flexibility. Women are a vast majority of cyber porn operators and are moving away from the exploitive porn industry in favor of cyber. These actions are motivated by the same concerns of traditional working women, salary, control, personal security, and flexibility. With the increase of female-owned businesses, pornography will start to grow and reflect women's desires and beliefs about sexuality, which is very important. I believe some people uh, can look at the sex industry and believe that it is just from the male gaze, and this is only participated by men, but it isn't. Um, it isn't. <laughs> Women participate just as much into the sex, into the sex industry in watching porn. So soon our desires will be in the porn that is out there instead of through the male gaze. When the conceptual framework surrounding sex work is viewed to be service work, safer opportunities to market their product will form. And this has, and lots of opportunities to market have formed and they are taking advantage in back passages and trying to go around uh, to work the system with sites like Snapchat, Instagram, Patreon, uh, Chatterbaits, OnlyFans. This rise of technology has given women direct access to the money. So I'm going to be using the term amateur cyber pornographers to mean online sex workers who work for themselves and or without a corporate male based porn creator behind them. So a big box porn creator. Um, amateur cyber pornographers are media savvy and porn friendly content creators who own their own body and power while selling a fantasy. Real amateurs are defined as sexually driven creators, media practitioners, and producers who use sexual scenes to explore their personal desires. This has given women and minority producers direct access to the money in this lucrative industry and increased visibility in their own field. Women are always adapting to new technical skills, knowledge of, a, of hosting, and understanding of how to satisfy a customer's desires. The user's desires for realness 
attempting to get as close to authentic as possible. If they're doing their job well, they are creating a fantasy of interaction and connection. Even though they are utilizing amateur strategies, they are also combining domestic and service work that rely on professionalism to produce labor. Uh, this helps remove stigma associated with the sex industry and saying these women were autonomous and motivated by personal desire. The sex industry is growing with technology and the rise of social media, which offers more access to more consumers for more workers. Although the internet is under a more watchful eye than ever before, it is also possible to remain relatively private without risking personal safety. I've learned as a feminist, we need to take a step back from our own unbiased opinions of sex work to form them and realize there is nothing wrong with the concept of sexual entertainment, but rather the underlying stigma around it is. I started this research because I have been able to explore and express my sexuality through sex work temporarily. When I started my research, my question I wanted to ask is if sex work was empowering or not. But after I started my research, I realized how far I was from understanding the desires and needs of sex workers. I have taken part of sex work expos and conventions to learn more about the community and gained valuable connections. I also want to acknowledge my privilege as an academic woman exploring as, an, as a semi-outsider and try to hold no biases towards women who are earning a, li a living. And here's a little picture from one of the conventions I went to and I actually still speak to this uh, dominatrix and she helped me gain a lot of my resources for this project. And I really um, enjoyed learning about sex work and I hope you've learned that sex work is service work. Thank you.